Hello world, I'm Sarah Matthews and in this video I'm going to walk you through how I image the Heart and Soul Nebulae from start to finish using a tripod, a star tracker, a camera, and a camera lens. I'm then going to walk you through how to process that data to get to a final color image. Um, my hope is that with this video it's going to provide a straightforward way to image these deep space objects with a wide field view uh, using a very portable and beginner friendly setup just like the one we're going to use. So without further ado, let's go set up. All right, so the first thing that we need to do is determine where we're gonna set up our equipment and be imaging for the night. And there are a few things that we need to consider. The first is, can I see Polaris or the South Celestial Pole if I'm in the Southern Hemisphere? Because I'm gonna be polar lining my star tracker to be able to account for the apparent motion of the night sky. Um, one way to do that during the day uh, is to use your compass app and see where north is or south is if you're in the southern hemisphere um, and that will give you kind of a rough estimation of where you're at or if it's at nighttime and you know where Polaris is you can always use the Big Dipper to do that. I will show you here now. So in addition to being able to see players, you probably also want to see your targets. Um, I know that the Heart and Soul Nebulae are in the constellation of Cassiopeia, which is going to come through that, that way uh, from east to west. But if you don't know where your targets are going to come uh, through, uh, you can always use a planetarium app like Stellarium or Sky Safari to map the trajectory of your targets throughout a night of imaging. You just want to make sure that you set up at a location that is as free um, from trees and houses and other things that could hinder your field, is, field of view as possible uh, for as long as possible. And then, of course, you also want to make sure that you find a location that has a fairly flat surface uh, to set up on. This is going to help a lot with polar alignment, just going to make the whole process a lot easier. Um, and of course, uh, but certainly not least, uh, last, last, but not cer last, but not certainly least, it's a tongue twister. Make sure that you're setting up in a location that is safe, both for yourself and your equipment. Um, there are a lot of sketchy places out there and you just want to make sure you're safe or else again, what's the point of imaging? Uh, so the next thing that we're going to do is go and set up our gear. So the first piece of equipment that we are going to set up is our tripod. I am using a um, Faisal carbon fiber tripod. Um, I got it from Amazon. I will post a link to it down below. Um, so yeah, I'll set that up now. Kind of just push down on it. It's good. So now that I have my tripod set up, um, I'm going to add the star tracker and all the components to the top of it. Um, so let's go do that now. The star tracker that I'm using today is the Skywatcher Star Adventurer. It is the Pro Pack and it comes with all of these pieces of equipment. So this is the first piece of equipment we are going to mount to the top of the tripod. It is the equatorial wedge and it looks like this. Uh, the bottom here will screw onto the top of the 3 8 inch screw of the tripod. The next thing I'm going to do is take this adapter here from the equatorial wedge and I'm going to thread it through um, the bottom of my star tracker. So I'm just going to screw this into the middle here and make sure the little stopper here is facing forward. Now we are ready to mount the star tracker to the equatorial wedge. So before I add my camera, my declination bracket, my counterweight kit, and my lens, I like to just do a rough polar alignment. And to do that, um, I need to first find my location's uh, latitude. I can find that in a few different ways. Um, I like to use the Sky Adventure console app. Uh, it's free to download. So in the app, I just go to the polar clock utility. Then I tap on location in the right hand corner and it shows my location's latitude, which is roughly 39 degrees. Now I can adjust my base here to 39 degrees. So now our star tracker is at the same angle as uh, Polaris is in the sky for our current location. 
Now that I have my latitude in, I have also oriented my setup to be facing north. Uh, since I am in the northern hemisphere, I'm going to be focusing my polar alignment on Polaris. So the front of my setup is facing north and it should look like this. If you don't know where north is, again, you can use your compass app. Now that I have my setup facing north, I need to find Polaris. And to do this, again, you can use a planetarium app like Stellarium or Sky Safari. Or you can use the Big Dipper, as I mentioned earlier, by finding the Ladles' two outer stars, then extending the line to the next brightest star, which should be Polaris. So once I have Polaris in view, I'm going to want to make sure that Polaris is centered down the top of my star tracker, and I may need to move my tripod legs until it's center. Uh, this is going to set us up for our accurate polar alignment later. And then what I'm going to want to do once I have Polaris um, in my uh, view from the top of my star tracker is I want to push down on my tripod the entire setup and make sure it's firm in the ground and level so that the polar alignment is going to be a lot easier for us after this. Now that we have a rough polar alignment, I'm going to start adding the rest of the equipment to the setup. This is a declination bracket. I'm going to slide it in through right here, but before I do that, I'm going to add the counterweight kit to it. So the counterweight kit comes with this counterweight pole and this counterweight right here. And now I'm just going to take the counterweight pole and screw it into the bottom of the declination bracket and I will then add the counterweight to it. And voila! Now we are going to thread the declination bracket through the center of the star tracker. And now I'm going to mount my camera to the top of the declination bracket. This is a Canon EOS RAW. It has a modified sensor uh, that makes it more sensitive to hydrogen alpha. Um, <clears throat> just as a note, uh, I am going to be screwing this into the collar of the camera. Do not do this if you're using a heavier lens. Uh, you would want to make sure that you are uh, using a collar uh, for your lens and screwing that into the top of the uh, declination bracket to distribute the weight at the pivot point evenly. Next, we are going to mount the camera lens to the camera. This is my Rokinon 135mm prime focus telephoto lens. It works great for wide field, deep spaced astrophotography. So in order to mount the camera lens to the camera, I have a Canon mount adapter EF to EOS R uh, mount adapter on my camera, and it looks like this. And I'm just going to mount the camera lens to the uh, mount adapter here now. Now I must balance my star tracker to ensure that there isn't stress to the gears. So first I'll unlock the RA clutch and move the load parallel to the ground like this. And it appears that my counterweight side is heavier. And that's a quick fix. I just need to adjust my counterweight and move it up towards the center of my counterweight bar like this. Now that we have all of our equipment on our setup and are balanced in the right ascension axis, we are going to do a precise polar alignment. And the reason I waited to do a precise polar alignment until now is because the polar alignment could have easily been thrown off during the mounting of all the other equipment and when we were balancing. So before we jump into polar lining, just be sure to have these items checked off. Number one, uh, be sure to remove the polar scope caps located on the back and in the front of the star tracker. If you haven't already, it might be a little tricky with the one in the front if you didn't remove it uh, before adding the declination bracket. Sorry about that. Uh, number two, add the polar scope illuminator and its extender to the declination bracket over the polar scope. This will be used to help with polar lining. Um, just be sure to turn it on to the amount of illumination that you would like. Um, but then once you're done using it, be sure to turn it off so you don't waste its battery. That's me talking from experience. And last, uh, be sure that the latitude base or the equatorial mount is mounted securely to the tripod and also make sure that the tripod itself is level and sturdy on the ground so that it won't move. So polar alignment in more depth is essentially pointing the axis of the star adventurer to the north celestial pole, which is where in the northern hemisphere that the earth rotates on its axis. If you are in the Southern Hemisphere, then you are going to be polar aligning your star tracker's axis to the South Celestial Pole, which, you guessed it, is where in the Southern Hemisphere that the Earth rotates on its axis. 
So since I am in the Northern Hemisphere, I'll be focusing my polar alignment process to the star Polaris, but if you are in the Southern Hemisphere, then you will be aligning your mount to the star Sigma Octantis, which is the closest star to the South Celestial Pole. So similar to Sigma Octantis in the Southern Hemisphere, Polaris is currently the closest star to the North Celestial Pole in the Northern Hemisphere, but it's not perfectly situated at the North Celestial Pole. It actually orbits closely around the North Celestial Pole. That being said, uh, the reticle inside of my star tracker, which looks like this, has this large circle around the North Celestial Pole in the middle. And that large circle is the apparent orbit of Polaris as it rotates around the North Celestial Pole. So what we need to do is we need to place Polaris on the correct position on the circle in the reticle for the current time and my location. I can find out where to place Polaris on the reticle by using the Star Adventure console app's polar clock utility function since I'm using the Star Adventure and the reticle you see here in the app is the same reticle you see inside the Star Adventure. However, if you are using a different star tracker like the iOptron SkyGuarder Pro for example, your reticle will look different. Um, so what you can do is you can use an app like Polar Scope Align instead, it is free to download. So once I have the app downloaded and opened, I would want to make sure that the reticle on the screen in the app matches the reticle for the star tracker that I have. I think by default, it's usually the iOptron one in the app, but I might be wrong. But for me in this case, uh, again, yeah, I am using the Skywatcher Star Adventure. So I would want to switch to that reticle in the app. I'll just show you how to change the reticle in the app just in case you want to see that. So I would go to settings down here, and then under current reticle, I see at the top it's listed for the iOptron. So what I would want to do is I would want to change my reticle by going here and selecting the Skywatcher uh, Star Adventurer reticle. And now my reticle in the app should be correct. And now it is, and that's awesome, and it shows where Polaris is on the reticle for my current location and time. Uh, you can manually uh, add in your time and location, or you can just sync it up with your phone's time and location. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make adjustments on my latitude base to get Polaris in the correct location on the reticle by looking into the reticle from the back of my star tracker. And I'm going to be using the altitude adjustment knob here in the front to move Polaris up or down in the reticle. And then I'm going to use these azimuth knobs in unison together on the back of my base to move Polaris right and left. So once I have players as close as humanly possible to the location that I can see in the app, I'm going to tighten my azimuth knobs and I'm going to be very careful not to adjust the placement of players while I do this. It's often helpful to tighten the azimuth knobs as I am moving the uh, knobs to get players in view. Now we should be polar aligned. So you might be wondering why my background has changed, and that's because trying to film the rest of these segments outside as the day turned in tonight, as most days do, um, turned out to be pretty underwhelming because I was using a really small little mobile light to film in the dark, so it was quite unfruitful. So I'm going to film the rest of these outside segments uh, inside my office, but the concepts I'm going to go over should all still be applicable as if we were outside. So now that we have accurate polar alignment, or now that I have hypothetically accurate polar alignment, we are ready to locate our DSOs and point our setup at our DSOs. So in order to find our DSOs, we can use a planetarium app like Stellarium or Sky Safari, and we can just plug in the name of our targets into our planetarium app, and it will show us where in the night sky our targets are for our location and the date and time. Um, or if you're just a pro at this, don't worry about it. But I do know what the Heart and Soul Nebulae are in the constellation of Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia looks like a W located between Polaris and the Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, so all I would do is look up to the night sky and find Polaris because God knows I've been staring at it for much longer than I would care to admit by this point. So I see Polaris and then I would just go down a little bit and I see the lovely W. I know that within the W, the Heart and Soul Nebula are at. And so now we are ready to point our setup at our DSOs. Uh, a few words of caution before we proceed though. Do not nudge or bump or throw your setup, like literally at all, because we just polar aligned and you will throw off your polar alignment. And my guess is you probably don't want to re-polar align because it's not the funnest activity to do although it is really good practice. So um, be very, very careful is my point. 
So in order to point our setup at a DSO, we are going to move our two axes, our right ascension axis and our declination axis. So the first thing I would do is I would unlock my right ascension axis, being very careful again not to move my setup. So let's just pretend for a moment that you are the heart and soul nebulae because you're my heart and soul. It's not weird, I promise. So what I'm gonna wanna do is I'm gonna move my right ascension axis this way, like this. And then I'm going to walk it so that it stays in place. Next, I'm going to move the declination axis here and point my camera lens at you, the heart and soul nebulae. So because we have a declination axis and we have a right ascension axis, we are able to point our setup at any point in the night sky. That's just because it's mathematically proven that way. So now that we are pointed at our DSOs, what I'm going to want to do next is turn on my star tracker to begin tracking the night sky. I'm going to want to be on the sidereal setting. The sidereal setting is uh, identified on the Skywatcher Star Adventure as this little star here. And now your star tracker will track the night sky. It's probably no surprise that in astrophotography, we are trying to image these very faint targets in low light conditions. And in order to collect as much light as we can, we have to keep our camera open for a lot longer during exposure than we would otherwise. And it also requires us to make our camera sensor a whole heck of a lot more sensitive to that light. Both of those things create a lot more noise in images, and in order to counteract that noise, we have to take multiple exposures of the same target and stack it all together to create a final image that hopefully has less noise and more light, or sometimes referred to as signal. So in order to be able to actually do this, we have to make some adjustments to our settings in our camera. These settings that I'm going to go over are just good benchmark settings for any DSLR or mirrorless camera that's going to allow us to use a camera lens like this to be able to use an external inter intervalometer to be able to control our night of imaging and just to have good overall settings. After this, we will get into our actual exposure settings for imaging the heart and soul nebulae. The first camera setting that we want to adjust is our white balance. Generally in astrophotography, you can use daylight or auto. And then also you're gonna to wanna to make sure that in your camera mode settings, you are shooting in raw and that your camera files as well are being taken and stored as raws too. Next, be sure to turn off the long exposure noise reduction setting in your camera. You don't need to worry about noise reduction because we'll take that out in post. And then your camera focus, be sure that it is set to manual focus. We are using a telephoto lens um, and we are going to be manually focusing it. Same if you are using a telescope. And then last, uh, your camera mode, since we are using an external intervalometer and we'll be taking multiple exposures, we want to make sure that our camera mode is set to bulb. Next, we are going to focus our camera lens. Again, I'm using a Rokinon 135mm prime focus telephoto lens, and it looks like this. The first thing that I'll want to do is turn my camera on and open up the live feed on the back of the camera. Now I'm going to change the ISO to 1600. Anything above 1600 is going to be good for this. Then I'm going to change the aperture on my camera's lens to about f2.8. Anything below f4 uh, is good because you're going to be letting a lot of light in. And then I'm going to change my camera lens's focus ring to the infinity sign. And then I'm just going to begin focusing. So the key to focusing stars is to move your camera lens's focus ring from left to right and watch the stars get bigger and smaller. Once you start to see them get smaller, keep um, going in that direction on your focus ring. And then once you have pinpoint stars, uh, just don't move your focus ring at all. Next, we are going to dial in our camera's exposure settings for imaging the heart and soul nebulae. And for those who don't know what exposure settings are with regard to uh, DSLRs or mirrorless cameras, basically just pertains to the shutter speed, the aperture, and the ISO. So I'm just gonna go over those at a very high level and how they interact with one another so that we can uh, better determine what the best settings are gonna be for our imaging session here. Let's start with shutter speed. Shutter speed basically means how long is each image going to be in my imaging session. 
how do I determine how long each image should be? Well, I'm so glad that you asked <laughs> because it depends on a few different things. The first is, how bright is my DSO? The second is, how light polluted are my skies? Am I using a light pollution filter? Because if I am, I can usually have longer exposed images. The third is, how good is my polar alignment? If I have superb polar alignment, well then I can usually have longer exposed images. But if I have bad polar alignment, I'm going to get star trails a lot earlier on. And the fourth is, Now let's talk about aperture. Now aperture pertains to your camera's lens and how much light it's allowing to get to your camera sensor. The wider the opening, the more light that's getting to your sensor. The smaller the opening, the less light that is getting to your sensor. Now ISO pertains to how sensitive your camera sensor is to that light. So putting it all together, once I have my camera pointed at my target and I have focused my camera lens and I have adjusted my camera settings, I like to determine my camera's exposure settings by first taking 30 second exposures with my camera lens's f-stop or the size of its aperture kicked down about one or two stops from its widest aperture, which in this case, the widest aperture is f2.0. So I'm going to decrease the aperture to its next f-stop, which is f2.8. And the reason I like to do this is because I want to keep my stars from bloating as the temperature changes throughout my night of imaging, and I also want to help with any potential star drifting that might happen. So for ISO, I like to start anywhere between 800 to 1600 ISO, and in this case I started with 1600 ISO. So the key is to kind of just find out what works best for your specific target with your exposure time settings and your ISO settings. Um, for example, I didn't have very long with this target. I had about two hours to collect light. So I knew that I needed to collect a lot of light pretty quickly. So um, what I went ahead with is uh, 1600 ISO um, with 90 second exposures at f2.8. But when in doubt though, just look at the histogram of your test images and assess from there. You want to try to have your images as histogram mounted of data in the 50% range or slightly to the right on the histogram. That way no data from shadows or from highlights are being clipped. Now that we have adjusted our camera settings and determined what our exposure settings should be given the brightness of our DSO, the darkness of the sky, the accuracy of our polar alignment, the wind conditions, and how long we have to image the target, we can set up our external intervalometer up for success. Since we are going to be taking multiple long exposures that are over 30 seconds apiece, remember we are taking 90 second exposures, I'm going to need an external intervalometer like this to control my imaging session. Because I do have a Canon, my camera does not have an internal intervalometer, but I believe Nikons do. The intervalometer I'll be using today is by Shoot. It looks like this, but I will link an intervalometer I recommend down below if you're interested. So first let's dial in the settings. The first section is for delay, which basically means how much time do you want before the first image starts? So say for example that you need some time to walk back to another area like your tent or go back inside your house You'll want to set up some time for yourself in your delay for you to walk away from your imaging setup So that you don't cause your first or your first few images to be blurry from walking around nearby So I'm going to input 10 seconds here So from right to left the first section is for seconds the second section is for minutes and the third is for hours And so 10 seconds should look like this Next, we have long, and long refers to, you guessed it, how long do you want your exposures to be? So remember, I want mine to be 90 seconds, and in this case, I would input it as one minute and 30 seconds, so I'll input a one in the minute section and 30 seconds in the seconds section. Next, we have interval, or here it's listed as INTVL, which essentially means how much time after each sub-exposure is complete do you want before the next sub-exposure starts. I like to use anywhere between 1 to 5 seconds for DSOs, but it's totally up to you and really just depends on how quickly your specific camera can write and store a RAW file. Also, just remember that the longer the interval, the more time your camera sensor has to cool down a bit. These cameras, like a DSLR or a mirrorless camera, are not cooled, so I'm going to input 3 seconds. Next is the letter N, which stands for the number of exposures you want to take. Since I only had about an hour and a half to two hours of visibility with the Heart and Soul Nebulae and I would be taking 90 second exposures, I input 75 frames. Now you are ready to plug it into your camera. Here on the Canon EOS RAW, it's on the side here. 
and also make sure that your inner velometer isn't just dangling. I did put some Velcro on the back of the inner velometer as well as on one of the legs of my tripod. I can attach it that way. Just be sure that the cord is out of the way of the tracking. And also just double check that your tracker is actually on and on the sidereal setting and you are ready to press start. Yay, we have made it to our calibration frame section of this video. Uh, before you skip over this section, uh, just hear me out. Calibration frames really do make your final images so much better. Um, I will go over them now for you if you're interested, and if you're not, just pass over it. But yeah, calibration frames are your friends. They are awesome. So here we go. So as I mentioned before, calibration frames really do make our images of the night sky so much better because they help to remove all of the unwanted parts of our images like artifacts from camera bias noise, heat noise, dust, and so many other things. But ultimately what they're doing is helping to increase the signal or the light to noise ratio in our final image so that your final image is a lot cleaner and has way more detail in it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go over the types of calibration frames that there are for DSLR and mirrorless cameras. I'm just going to keep this at a very high level and then I'm going to go over how to take them. I'm not going to get into any of the math here because getting into the math is um, could be truly its own series in and of itself. So let's jump into the types of uh, calibration frames. So first, yes, we took our light frames and light frames were the images that we took for our subject. But bias frames are calibration frames that help to reduce the fixed pattern noise in our images. So your camera will have readout noise from reading each pixel on your sensor as you take each image. And this is called bias and it is random. So in order to eliminate that, you can isolate the bias by taking bias frames that will then be removed or calibrated from the light frames. Now dark frames help to counteract the noise in astro images that happens as a result of the temperature of your camera sensor during each exposure. Your camera sensor warms up quite a lot while each image is being taken, which causes thermal camera noise. And thermal camera noise manifests itself in images as grain and unwanted artifacts that ultimately reduce the quality of your images. So you're going to need to take and use dark frames to counteract that noise in your astro images. What this is going to do is it's going to improve the signal to noise ratio and improve the details in your astro images. Flat frames are essentially a portrait of your optical system, and this includes the dust that shows up in your optical system um, that show up in your images as little dust shadows or dust motes, um, as well as the vignetting or the darkening of the corners of your images. So by taking flat frames, we can actually eliminate the dust shadows and vignetting. How do you take calibration frames? So with bias frames, bias frames are going to be taken with the lens cap on your camera lens in complete darkness. You're going to want to set your exposure time to the fastest shutter speed on your camera. For me, with my camera, it's 1 8,000th of a second, so just be sure to take your camera out of bulb mode and switch to manual mode to do this. So with ISO, be sure that you keep it at the same ISO that you took your light frames with, which for me was ISO 1600. You'll also want to do your best to take your bias frames at the same temperature as your light frames, so just try to take them immediately after you take your light frames. Uh, last but not least, take anywhere between 20 to 50 bias frames. Like bias frames, you're going to take your dark frames with the lens cap on in total darkness, but uh, the exposure length is actually going to be the same exposure length that you took your light frames with. So in my case, I took 90 second or um, a minute and 30 second exposures for my light frames, so I'm going to take the same amount of exposure length for my dark frames. Also, be sure to set your camera mode back to bulb for this. ISO wise, um, we are going to be using the same ISO that we did with our bias frames and our light frames, which for me was 1600 ISO. And just like with your bias frames, be sure to take these dark frames at the same temperature that you took your light frames at. So try to do them immediately after you take your bias frames or your light frames. Um, the next thing you'll do is set your intervalometer to take anywhere between 20 to 25 of them. Unlike bias and dark frames, which were taken in a non-illuminated environment, flat frames are actually going to be taken in the presence of light. This can be either natural light, such as at dusk or dawn, or with an electronically illuminated light, such as a tablet with a white screen. I like to diffuse the light by carefully wrapping a white t-shirt on the front of my lens and then using an iPad with a white screen in front of the camera. Just be very, very, very careful not to adjust the focus ring at all when you do this. 
And also be sure to take these before you disassemble your camera and your camera lens. Doing so afterwards would render your flats useless because the optical train has already been tampered with. Um, for your camera settings though, switch your camera mode from bulb to aperture priority or AV. This will allow your camera to determine the optimal shutter speed for your image. And then for your ISO, uh, just keep your ISO the same ISO that you took your light frames at. Uh, again, I took mine at 1600 ISO, so my flat frames will also be taken at 1600 ISO. And then you're going to want to take about 30 frames. Now we are done with our calibration frames and our light frames, and we can bring them over to our computer and start to edit them. I have gone ahead and transferred my images onto my computer from my camera's memory card. I have organized them into their respective folders, so I have my biases here, my darks here, my flats here, and my lights. What I'm going to want to do is start to review my lights uh, for any weird anomalies like out of focus stars or star trailing or uh, satellite trails or plane trails. So I would just click on my lights folder and I would start with my first one. So just as a note, I've already gone through my images. Um, so I could just click on the spacebar with the Mac and here's my first image. So again, what I was looking for is any out of focus stars. So any stars that were bloating, if I had any star trail, any of my images, as well as any trails from satellites or from planes. So yes, I do have a blue hue in my images and that's because I used a light pollution filter, um, but I can fix that in post. But yeah, I ended up with about 60 total light frames out of the 75 that I took. And now what we can do is bring them all into Cyril and begin processing them. With our calibration in light frames reviewed and organized into their respective subfolders um, in a folder on my desktop, we are ready to go ahead and calibrate, align, and stack the images to get to a um, stacked image. And then we'll take that stack image and we will process it a little bit more to get to a final color image. So jumping back into calibration frames really quick here, um, what we're going to be doing is using them to remove artifacts in our light frames. And then what we will do is uh, use those calibrated light frames and align them. And then we will integrate them or stack them all together to get to that final stacked image I was talking about. Um, this final stacked image is going to have increased signal to noise ratio, which again, this basically just means more details or light and less artifacts. So to do this, it is fairly simple. We are going to be using a pre-processing script from a software called Cyril, and we will also be using the software to process our final image a little bit more. Um, so for those who don't know about Cyril already, Cyril is a really great free astronomical imaging processing tool that is compatible with Mac, Windows, and Linux operating systems. So here I'm on the Cyril.org website. You can download um, the application to whichever uh, operating system that you have. So I have a Mac, so I would download the 64-bit Mac OS, and then I would just follow the installation um, instructions after that. It is very, very straightforward to download and install. But once you have it installed, open it up, and it should look like this. I'm running version 1.0.4. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to bring your attention to is this blue scripts button here at the top of the interface. Um, so in this drop down menu, you're going to see a whole host of different pre-processing scripts. So I'm only going to be using one. I'm going to be using this one shot color pre-processing script or OSC because A, I used a mirrorless camera, but if you used a DSLR camera or some other type of one shot color camera, this is um, another option that you would want to choose from. Um, and also, again, because I have all of my calibration frames, my biases, my darks, and my flats, and my light frames, and I've organized them like I showed you in those respective folders, um, I'm going to be using that script. But if you don't have all of those uh, calibration frames, say for instance you only took, I don't know, darks and lights, well then you can install more scripts like I have. So here I am on freeastro.org under the scripts uh, page. All you need to do is just Google um, free serial scripts and it should be the first website listed. So this page has the instructions for the serial scripts and then I would just scroll down and here you'll find all those other scripts I was talking about. Of course, you can create your own scripts in Serial, but um, these are already created, which is really handy. 
So again, yeah, say for instance you only have your dark calibration frames and your lights. Well, that's no problem. We can actually download and install um, this, uh, this script into Surreal. So it would be that one-shot color pre-processing without flat.ssf file. So I would just click on it and then I would download it. And then in my downloads folder, I would move that file into the Surreal application folder. There should be a uh, folder for scripts and I would just uh, move it under there. Then I would um, want to close Surreal and then open it back up and then it should be listed here down in the scripts. So again, yeah, I have all of my calibration frames and my light frames and I did use a one-shot color camera, my mirrorless camera. So I'm going to be using this one-shot color pre-processing script to get to a final stacked image. But the next thing that I would need to do is I would need to tell Surreal what my home directory is for the scripts to be or for that script to actually work. So I would come over here to this blue little house here and I'm going to click on that and I already have my home directory selected. So um, it is in a folder. So my home directory is a folder that's on my desktop. Um, so I have again my biases organized here, my darks here, my flats here, my lights here. You again want to make sure that they are organized just like this um, with this script for the script to work. So I would press open and you should see the home directory listed here. So the next thing that I'm going to do is actually run the script. So I'd come down to OSC preprocessing. And this is basically just a warning that, you know, doing all these steps on their own um, may yield better results, but that's fine. I'm just going to run the script anyways. And then what you'll see here over in the console app is the application or you'll see the script running. Um, this will probably take a few minutes um, or hours depending on uh, what your computer's processing power is. If it ends up failing, it could be for a couple of reasons. One is because you um, aren't using the correct script or you didn't organize your files correctly. Or it could be that you don't have enough working memory on your computer. So, um, you know, those could be two options that you could try troubleshooting. So once it's done, I will come back. All right, and we are done here. So it looks like here on the console section that it took a total of six minutes and three seconds to run the process. So now I'm going to want to open up the image. So I'm just going to come up here to open and you should see two new items in your home directory folder. I have process folder or I have a process folder here and I have my final stacked image, which is result.fit. So open that up. And it looks like this doesn't look like much because it's still in a linear state and so I will apply a non-linear stretch um, in a little bit, but in the interim I will apply a temporary auto stretch coming down here and switching that to auto stretch. So over here um, you're going to see, so up here you're going to see your final image under RGB. You're going to see the blue channel in your final image, the green channel of your final image, and the red channel in your final image. The RGB channel or combination channel is just going to be um, for visualization anyways, so you can't use any processes on it. So I'm going to be working on the red channel just because I can see more detail with it, but whatever uh, channel is the most um, detail friendly for you, uh, pick that one to work in. So the first thing that I'm going to want to do is crop any weird black edges that I have. I did have um, a few and you just want to remove those because they will throw off some of the other processes we're going to be doing. Um, so I'm going to do crop like this. All you need to do is um, click left on your mouse and then draw a box like this and then press right on your mouse and it's going to give you all these different options. I'm going to press selection because I want to keep my uh, crop ratio to 3 by 2. So that looks pretty good for now. Um, I may adjust it later. Actually, that later has come, so I'm going to just do it to here. Feel free, again, to do whatever crop that you want. Just make sure that you are getting rid of any black edges on the edge of your um, image. So right click again, crop, and there we go. So here, I'm just going to go back to linear, auto stretch, I'm actually going to go to histogram. Histogram is another um, type of auto, um, auto stretch, it's just more intense. 
so here is my image again with the crop. Uh, next we are going to remove gradients because there are a whole host of them from light pollution. Um, so gradients from our images like light pollution either from the moon or nearby cities um, will show up like this. They're just unwanted light signal and gradient like this becomes more apparent after stacking when the addition of the pixels uh, brings out the signal from the noise. Oh, and also, uh, the gradient isn't always evenly distributed across the images we stack together, so removing the gradients becomes a little bit more complex once we've stacked it into a final image. So in order to get rid of these complex gradients, we're going to use a tool called uh, Background Extraction. Um, so I'm going to come up here to Image Processing, down here to Background Extraction, and the dialog box looks like this. So for the interpolation method, I'm going to keep it at RBF. For the smoothing factor, I'm going to keep it at 0.5. Um, and then I am going to generate the samples. You can um, add these samples manually if that's what you prefer to do, but I just found that with this data set, um, generating it automatically helped the most because I did have a lot of gradients and I used a light pollution filter and I didn't uh, white balance it before. Uh, so anyways, yeah. You may want to just mess around with these settings and see what works best for you guys. So I'm going to click on generate and you'll see some of these red boxes show up on your nebulae and if that's the case, um, just right click on your mouse over the red boxes that are on your nebulae and remove them. So I'm going to do that now. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is because I don't want the synthetic model that this is going to create to have any of the model based off of my nebulae. So I am pretty happy with that. So I'm going to come down here to correction type. It's going to be subtraction. Um, sometimes I might do division, but I'm just going to keep subtraction for now. And I'm going to click on compute background. All right, so my image is looking decent. Um, yeah, again, this has been a tricky image for me to process because, yeah, using a light pollution filter that I didn't didn't create a um, custom white balance for is a little bit difficult here, but that's fine. All right, so now that we have done background extraction, I am going to use what's called photometric color calibration. So I'm going to be color calibrating my image. Um, so I'm going to come up here again to image processing color calibration and photometric color calibration and basically what this does is it um, pulls data from different catalogs online, um, astronomical catalogs, and it will match the colors for your specific region of the night sky, which is really cool. So um, I have two targets here, so I'm just going to pick one. I'm going to do the um, the Sol Nebulae, so the catalog uh, designation for that is IC1848. I'm going to click on find. And there it is in two different catalogs, so I'll just keep the NED one selected. And then um, for your focal distance and pixel size, if it doesn't automatically populate, go ahead and click on Get Metadata from Image, and then if it doesn't populate from there, um, just input it yourself. Um, so it should be your focal distance of your lens or your telescope and your pixel size of your camera. And then keep everything else the same and click OK. And you'll see down here in the console window that it is running and it's been applied. So we can close out that process. Now, the next thing that I'm going to want to do is I'm going to just sharpen some of the details and reduce some of the star size here. Uh, so I'm gonna come up here to image processing, down here to deconvolution. So um, I'm going to um, re just reduce the radius of the kernel size to about 0.8. The key with uh, deconvolution is to make sure that your stars do not have what's called uh, de-ringing or have ringing around the star, which would show up as um, like a black halo because you've reduced the star size so much that there's just an absence of the actual um, pixels um, from before. So yeah, I don't see that right now, um, but yeah, just make sure that you're looking out for that. And then coming down here, I would probably change the iterations down or up to about 24. Again, these are just example parameters uh, for my data set. Uh, mess around with uh, these parameters for your data set. And then I'm going to click apply. Okay, cool.
Oh, another thing that I forgot to mention about uh, color calibration, uh, the photometric color calibration, is that it um, helped to white balance my image as well. So the next thing I'm going to do is soften this image a little bit, and I'm going to try to bring out the details of the nebulae a little bit more. So I'm going to come up here to image processing, and I'm going to come down here to median filter. And I'm going to keep the kernel size uh, 3x3, but the iterations I'm going to increase to 5. But for modulation, I'm going to decrease to... Let me just write this in 0.5. Um, so for your data set, just see what works best for for it. These are again just examples, but I found that these uh, parameters work pretty well. So maybe start there and then press apply. And boom, it is done. So um, what I didn't go over before is uh, here are the before and after. Um, little arrows so here's the before the median um, filter and here's the after so it did a really good job so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stretch the image I'm going to move it back to a linear state so yes it looks like this and there are a few ways that I could stretch the image um, but I'm just gonna keep it really simple because my goal with this whole video has just been to keep it as simple as possible both from the equipment how to use all, all of it um, all the way to uh, processing. I just want to keep it as simple as possible. Um, so I have changed it back to a linear state of a view and then I'm going to come over to image processing down to histogram transformation and here is the histogram um, transformation dialog box. So I'm going to apply the auto stretch to the uh, image here in its linear state, the one that we were um, using a little bit before this. So I'm just going to click here and so what it's done is it's applied that auto stretch um, so I'm just going to maybe bring down the black point a little bit just to that. That looks fairly decent. Um, okay. So the next thing that I'm going to want to do is remove some of this green haze over my image. Um, yours may have even more green haze and that's because of your Bayer matrix in your DSLR. Um, there are more green pixels, so you would see a um, um, you would see more green in your image. So that's fine. All you need to do is come up here to image processing, uh, remove green noise, and we are going to apply. Um, you can just keep everything as is. So press apply, and it's done a fairly good job. So the next thing that I would want to do is I would want to increase the saturation a bit. So I'm come up here to image processing, color saturation and I'm going to keep the hue at global, so that means all hues. I'm just going to increase the amount probably to, I don't know, let's, like, let's just see what looks good. Okay, that looks fairly decent. Move the background factor. Just keep it at one. Press apply. Okay, so, oh, actually, I don't like that. <laughs> so let me redo that again. So let me just bring it up to, I don't know, 0.5, does that look okay? Okay, that looks pretty good. So yes, I do have a little bit of gradient still left over. Um, that's just been an issue. I'm going to try using background extraction one more time. So let me just press generate. And I'm going to compute background. See if it does anything. Okay, actually, that looks pretty good. I am fairly happy with that. So I'm going to go with that. And um, I could just keep this as my final image, um, or I could bring it into Photoshop or GIMP. But uh, again, the whole like point of this video was to get you to a final color image um, fairly quickly because I know that sometimes it you know astrophotography can be kind of uh, a very long process so my hope is is that you know here is a final working state image and you know we've brought you from the beginning of how to get that data all the way to this point so um, you know I'm not perfectly happy with this image but um, I am happy with it in the sense that it is pretty good for, um, you know, what we were working with. So yeah, feel free to bring it into Photoshop or GIMP or something else if you'd like to um, make it a little bit more punchy. 
But yeah, um, I really appreciate if you've made it to the end of this video. And if you have any questions, please feel free to um, ask them down below. And as always, I really appreciate all of your ongoing support. And um, you know, if you like this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to my channel. And until my next video, I hope you all have clear skies.